Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season, we'll be discussing the sacraments of the Catholic Church, and today we're talking about the Eucharist. We know the Eucharist is the actual body and blood of Jesus in the form of bread and wine, but where did it come from? Of course, the short answer is that Jesus established the Eucharist, but how and why? How far back does the Mass go? The first sign that we see of bread and wine being the perfect sacrifice is in the book of Genesis. But Melchizedek, the king of Salem, bringing forth bread and wine, for he was the priest of the Most High God. Genesis 14.18 Notice that Melchizedek is both a priest and a king, a very rare combination in the ancient world. In fact, Melchizedek is totally unprecedented in the whole history of mankind, as it says in the book of Hebrews. For this Melchizedek was king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abraham divided the tithes of all, who first indeed, by interpretation, is king of justice, and then also king of Salem, that is, king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but likened unto the Son of God, continueth a priest for ever. Now consider how great this man is, to whom also Abraham, the patriarch, gave tithes out of the principal things. Hebrews 7, 1 to 4. In other words, Melchizedek was a truly great man, with no father or mother, both a priest and a king, and in a position to bless even Abraham, the chosen one of God. Clearly, he was even closer to God than Abraham himself. And what did Melchizedek offer as a sacrifice? Bread and wine. Now let's look at John chapter 6. Jesus has begun his ministry, and a crowd has gathered to listen to him. He speaks to the crowd. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall not hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live for ever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. Then Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life in you. John six thirty five. 52 and 54. I could do an entire episode on the contents of John 6, and I may do so someday. For now, though, it's enough to recognize three things about John chapter 6. First, that Jesus clearly uses the terminology of offering bread in this discourse, just as Melchizedek did. Second, that Jesus clearly says that the bread that gives life will be his flesh. Third, that Jesus clearly says that no one has life within them unless they eat his flesh. This might as well be a divine command. We are required to eat the flesh of Jesus in order to obtain eternal life. This point in particular should be troubling for anyone who doesn't believe in the Eucharist, since how else are you going to fulfill this obligation? How else can you possibly eat the flesh of Jesus? Of course, at the time, no one really understood how Jesus could give his body to them to eat, particularly in such a way that he could call it bread, and this is really only brought together at the Last Supper. And taking bread, he gave thanks and break, and gave to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for a commemoration of me. In like manner, the chalice also, after he had supped, saying, This is the chalice, the New Testament in my blood which shall be shed for you. Luke 22, 19-20 Here, Jesus once again identifies himself with bread, at the same time as he offers it as a sacrifice. Not only do we see the precise formula used in the modern Catholic Church, this is my body, this is, and my blood, but these words of Jesus are unmistakable in any language. This is my body refers to the bread-like substance that Jesus held up. This means one of two things. One, it really was the body of Jesus, or else. Two, Jesus was wrong about something, or worse yet, lying. Furthermore, not only does Jesus change the bread and wine into his body and blood at the Last Supper, but he tells the disciples to do the same, implying that they are able to do the same. 
Moving forward to after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, there's a scene where Simon Peter and another disciple are walking on the road to Emmaus, talking about what's happened. A person walks up to them, who later turns out to be Jesus, and begins to explain things to them. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things that were concerning him. And it came to pass, whilst he was at table with them, he took bread and blessed and brake and gave to them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Luke 24, 27 and 30 to 31. Jesus is not only recognized by his disciples because of the way he breaks the bread, but before doing so, he does something else that should be familiar. He recites passages from the scriptures and explains how they apply to the situation the disciples have been facing. In other words, these are scripture readings followed by a sermon, just like in the Holy Mass. Jesus begins his celebration of the Eucharist with readings and a sermon. Now, how did the early Christians treat the Eucharist? How did they treat the Mass? Well, St. Paul makes reference to the Lord's Supper and warns people against all sorts of wild conduct at it. But much of the Mass was kept secret and revealed only to Christians for a long time after the resurrection of Jesus. The first time that a full account of the Mass was given in writing to a non-Christian was a little over a century later by a man named Justin, who we now refer to as St. Justin Martyr, in a letter written to the Emperor Antonius Pius Caesar. In that letter, now known as the First Apology, he speaks in great detail about the Mass. In fact, there isn't time here to quote all the things that he says, but just to give you the highlights. And on the day called Sunday, all who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read, as long as time permits. Then, when the reader has ceased, the president verbally instructs and exhorts to the imitation of these good things. Again, a description of the readings in the sermon. Those who are called by us deacons give to each of those present to partake of the bread and wine mixed with water over which the thanksgiving was pronounced, and to those who are absent they carry away a portion, and this food is called among us the Eucharist. A description of how bread and wine are used in the Eucharist. So likewise have we been taught that the food which is blessed by the prayer of his word, and from which our blood and flesh by transmutation are nourished, is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. Finally, a clear understanding that the bread and wine actually become Jesus himself at the Mass. This is the history of the Eucharist, prefigured by Melchizedek, predicted by Jesus, established by him at the Last Supper, and carried on from the earliest years of the Church with the full assurance that the Eucharist was most definitely Jesus himself. Next time, what purpose does the Eucharist serve? Why did Jesus establish this sacrament? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.